Hello and welcome to Smart Family of Cooling Products. I'm Todd and today I'm going to walk you through our SCOD 101 AR4 air-cooled industrial scroll chiller. This unit is built specifically for rental applications and we're going to walk you through a variety of things on this unit and then show you how to do a startup. Right here is your operator panel. You'll see your VFD displays. These are the time delay relays. We'll talk about those a little bit later when we're actually doing the startup for the unit. You've got your VFD bypass for your condenser fans if you have any issues or you just want to run straight 100%. Your compressors right here, on off switches, all right. And then your cooling probe selections. You can actually run off of leaving fluid or return fluid. And here's your C450 controller. This is kind of the heart of what controls the compressors. We're not going to talk about how to change set points on that controller during this video. However, there is a great video that Brett did. It's on our YouTube channel. So you can look at Smart Family Cooling Products on YouTube and search up C450 and you can find the, the startup video, excuse me, the uh, temperature adjustment video for that. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is when it shows up at the job site or to your branch, A, what are we going to look for, and B, how are we going to fill the system to get it ready to run? So the first thing you want to do is when it shows up either to the job site or to your branch, you're going to see multiple drain points on this skid, okay? Those should be left open from the last job site. Why, you probably ask. Well. You don't want water sitting in the pump casing or in the piping or in the evaporator during transit, especially if you're in the winter months too where they could freeze and then you could have all kinds of damage uh, and then you have to call us to get the units repaired. We don't want that. All right. Uh, the other reason is obviously cast iron pump, cast iron piping or carbon steel piping. So when you leave water sitting there for periods of time, it is going to rust and it's just better if you can have it drained while it's in storage. But once the unit gets to the job site, you can close off the drain valves. You can see we've already connected the hose right here. We filled up this system. All right, so this one's open, this one's closed. We've already filled the system. So this is closed off already, okay? And then we'll walk around this way and I'll show you a couple more spots. There's another vent here. And if my cameraman can get down this far, there is actually a automatic air vent up in there as well, which you, the only thing you want to make sure with that one is the cap doesn't get too loose to where it could fall off. Um, you, you just want that one open just the slightest bit to allow additional air to purge out of the system. While I'm down here, I'm going to go ahead and show you this too. This is a digital flow meter on the unit. So if you ever want to check flow, what's going through the piping at any given point in time, you can come down here and check it out. It is calibrated for water. So if you're running glycol, there is going to be a little bit of a variance there. Okay, I just want to point that out to you. One more thing we want to talk about while we're back here is this unit is set up with the piping that you can use either the onboard pump or an on-site pump at the facility, the installation location, wherever you're putting the chiller, okay? We've done that by adding some additional valves. So we've got the suction valve coming into the pump. We've got a bypass valve, which is located right on the backside of this panel. We're using the onboard pump, so you can see this valve is open, okay? The valve handle is parallel with the pipe, which means it's open. Our bypass valve is currently perpendicular to the pipe, so it's running, your pipe's running this way, it's running that way, so it's closed. If we were using a sight pump, we're going to close this off and we're going to open the valve that's behind this panel right here, okay? So that's an important thing to note. One more thing, we, we will mention um, when we talk about step three in our startup is ensuring that we get proper flow to the evaporator and the Y strainer is kind of critical with that. And the reason for that is because it can get clogged with debris. It sits on the job site for a while. You're dealing with a lot of hosing and things like that that can get debris inside of them. So those 
can get clogged. You can open this to drain some of the debris out of there, but it's not gonna always get all of it out. You can pull these four bolts off, pull the screen out and hose it off and make sure you get the rest of the dirt off of it, okay? Okay, so before we start doing the steps of startup, we've gotta talk about safety because whenever you're on a job site, uh, even at, at your branch, you've got to make sure that you're adhering to the most stringent safety you can because it, you, your health and your safety is most important. Okay. Now at Smart Family, our safety requirements for PPE is a hard hat, gloves approved per the job, a reflective vest or clothing, safety glasses, which you can see, and steel-toed boots or shoes. You also need to be properly trained and authorized to work on any HVAC equipment prior to performing a startup. And we want you to understand that this video is great, helpful, informative, but it does not warrant a approval or authorization to work on equipment okay now before we move any further you have to make sure you have proper power to the unit and if you ever wonder well, how much power do I need how big of a generator do I need well the generator KW is listed on this tag right here 175 KW for this specific unit and this is, will be on every smart family unit. We show a tag that has the unit RLA and the generator size, okay? We're gonna walk around on the side over here. Okay, so the next thing we wanna show you is the unit nameplate right here. You'll see the factory order is right here and the serial number for the unit is right there. So if you have any service issues, parts issues uh, down the road, hopefully 10, 20 years from now, uh, this is where you'll find the information you need when you call in to talk to either service or a parts department. Model number is located here, shows you your refrigerant type right here, and then the charge is located here as well for each circuit. Down here at the bottom, you got RLA, your run load amps, minimum circuit ampacity, and your max fuse size. If you look at this curve right here, the top is listed on this side over here and your flow is along the bottom here. So if you know you have eight PSI of pressure drop, you can look on the curve right here, go across and come down and you're at roughly 235 GPM. Okay, we actually need 240 GPM in here. Yay, we're close. <laughs> All right, so that's the, the, before we go through the steps, that's some of the important stuff we wanna cover, okay? Now, once we're at that point, let's go through the five steps. The first step is to do a walk around on the unit, ensure there wasn't any damage during transit. And if there is any damage, you wanna make sure and you report it back to the branch it came from so you don't get charged for it, all right? The second thing is to ensure you have flow to the unit so that there's fluid in the piping, right? So we've covered that already. And look, the third thing was to make sure the Y strainer was clean. Hey, we talked about that too. So we've done a little bit of the prep work just in our inspection of the unit and going through it, okay? So that's why you wanna do all that before you ever put power to the unit and get started, okay? so. I just mentioned power. Well, step four is to make sure you have proper power to the unit. And the other thing when we talk about proper power is this unit has a main unit disconnect, okay? But all that does is protect everything downstream. So everything in these panels is protected by that circuit breaker. Well, that's great, however, it's the customer's responsibility to provide upstream disconnect means as well. Now that could be an eyeline panel, it could be a customer MCC, or it could be a disconnect at the generator. 
whatever means that is, it's the customer's responsibility to provide that, okay? Now, we're ready to start this unit, but before we do that, we want to make sure that we have our flow and cooling turned off. Okay, they are. We're at a point in here, we've got our VFD all set to VFD mode, that's fine. We are going to go ahead and turn these to the on position. The C450 controller will handle cycling all the compressors, okay? So even though we've turned these on, they won't turn on unless the controller is telling it to turn on. All right? So at this point, we're going to take a break. We're going to put power on the generator, and we're going to come back. All right. So now we come to what is actually probably the easiest part of all of this, turning the unit on. First thing you have to do after you've completed all the other steps we've talked about today, turn on the main disconnect. And you may or may not be able to see that this is lit up right now for the incorrect power. Okay, it's timed out. You see your control power came on. All right. So what's the next thing you have to do? We talked about flow, right? You have to ensure proper flow to the unit. So we're gonna turn our pump on. You see pump on right here. If you had any issues, the pump trip would like, would come on or no flow. And we're good there. You typically want to let your pump run for a few minutes before you turn on your compressors. We've already run this unit today. If you want to verify, you can come down and look at your flow meter. You can see we've got about 200, well, it's varying between 210 and 215 GPM right now. All right, now it's all the way up to 230, so you'll see a little bit of variance. Okay, so we've ensured we've got flow. We're gonna go ahead and turn on our cooling. Now these compressors do have a one minute time delay per circuit. I've turned it down a little bit on this one just for our video purposes. But the first compressor would time out for a minute, then the second compressor would come on after the second minute, and then the third, if necessary, would come on after three minutes, okay? it's a warm day here you probably can't see it but right now it's telling us our temperature is about 91 degrees that's pretty hot okay so for our testing purposes that's fine you probably wouldn't want to be on a job site and have fluid coming back that hot to your chiller okay and as we would stand here and continue the rest of the compressors would cycle on for us. You'd be able to hear all those. The temperature would start to drop down. But that's pretty much it. We've gone through the five steps. We talked about the walk around, ensuring flow to your evaporator and your unit. Three was checking your Y strainer to make sure there's no debris in it. There goes your second compressor. Step four was we talked about power and upstream disconnect means. And then five was starting the unit. We thank you for watching and please stay safe out there.